Education, Environment, Sustainability. Can we have a roll call, please? Calling the roll, Ms. Simon? Here. Ms. Brown? Here. Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones is absent. Ms. Stevens? Ms. Stevens is absent. Mr. Brady? Mr. Brady is absent. There is not a quorum. Also, like the record to reflect that Councilman Miller is in attendance. Okay, thank you. We have minutes, I guess. Um, we can't even approve the minutes, minutes, so we'll carry them to the next meeting. No matters to refer to committee, but I want to thank everybody for coming today. Um, we're going to have a presentation from Harvey Webster, Director of Cleveland Museum of Natural History, to talk about um, the, the Lights Out Cleveland program, and he's going to give us a presentation, and we have Public Works here. Thank you for being here, and other people in the back. Boyle. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate this. I've wanted um, this presentation to be um, made for a while, and I'm glad we're able to do it. So, well, it's okay. my pleasure to be here, and, and good afternoon, all. Um, I do come from the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. My title is Chief Wildlife Officer and Museum Ambassador, and I have been an employee there for 45 years. And so, one of the things I do is I manage the Perkins Wildlife Center. And uh, we have been over the years very active and actively involved in issues of wildlife and sustainability, restoration of bald eagles, peregrine falcons nesting on our um, downtown buildings. So um, it became clear to me about 10, 12 years ago when I was in Chicago that there was a threat to birds in our cities. And you know, think about our cities and there's birds everywhere. There's sparrows and there's starlings and there's pigeons. But this threat actually was posed by the city itself. And the threat was to migratory birds. So I'm going to get into this little PowerPoint I've got. OK, give me a minute. I wanted just to say that Councilman Jones is here. And we just started um, Harvey Webster's presentation. So what do I need? Uh, just hit forward or? One minute. So we've got our, thank you. So when you're getting started, we're just going to approve some minutes. If um, okay. I'm going to make them, we have minutes from October 30th, 2019, um, a joint meeting with Health and Human Service and a meeting for sustainability. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Second by Ms. Uh, Councilman Jones. All in favor, aye. Minutes aye. are approved. And so um, we're going to start again. Okay. okay. So. We know that we've got a lot of birds that we see in Cleveland. So this is an image right here that shows um, a, a view of downtown from the Cuyahoga River. And everything you see, that little blurry speck in the foreground, is a gull. There's probably the better part of 15,000 gulls in this image. So that we know that we have a lot of birds that share this space with us. And sometimes those birds um, can cause a little havoc, like the one time that the gulls were gathering on the center field. Um, at Progressive Field, and um, I believe it was a tie ball game in the 10th inning, and the Indians were at bat, and it turns out that, uh, I think it was, I can't remember who it was, the, the Indians who hit a well-struck ball that headed, you know, a grounder to center field. Coco Crisp, who was with Kansas City at the time, not with us, is charging the ball only the ball hits a gull and goes careening off in another direction, at which point Major League Baseball told the Cleveland Indians, do something about the gulls, um, which they did. They just would fire off one of those big boomer fireworks between innings. And the reason the gulls were there, all they were doing was anticipating the end of the game so they could get in the bleachers and eat all the peanuts and the hot dogs and all the stuff. That, that So they're just they're taking advantage of that. And we see that over and over again. There are places on MLK, as I'm coming to work every day, I sometimes see wild turkeys. And it's interesting because they sometimes come out and attack hubcaps, why I do not know. If you get around town, you find some of our cell phone towers have ospreys, which are a kind of fish hawk that are actively nesting on top of the cell phone towers, beautifully taking advantage of human structures in the downtown. This is a turkey vulture close up on the right, but you see the communication tower to the left, and every black speck you see there is a turkey vulture. And the turkey vulture, a scavenging bird, is becoming more and more common um, in the city and the suburbs. And some people get scenes like this on top of their roof which if that was my roof, I would think that those vultures knew something about my fate that I didn't. <laughs> um, and of course, we all know that you go to any park and you usually have to wade through, through a bunch of 
Canada geese. So there are many different kinds of birds which have adapted to the human landscape. But what I'm talking about today are migratory birds. So check out these feathered jewels. So these are what we call warblers. There's a chestnut-sided warbler upper left, a black-throated green warbler, a uh, bay-breasted warbler, and a black-throated blue warbler. There are more than 30 different varieties of these feathered jewels, and they some of them nest in Ohio, but many are just passing through in spring and fall. They're on their way to Canada to nest in the spring, and they're going back on south to the, in the fall. And the um, uh, Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology calculated that there are some 3.5 billion birds which cross over our southern boundary, fence or not, um, and of those 3.5 billion birds coming in from South and Central America to the U.S., about 2.6 billion are bound for Canada. In the fall, because all these birds have nested and had youngsters, there are 4 billion birds coming down south out of Canada into the U.S. and 4.7 birds heading to Central and South America. So this is an extraordinary phenomenon. It's an amazing thing, and unfortunately, I will tell you that just recently, that same Cornell Lab of Ornithology published a scientific report that suggested that since 1970, we have lost about 29% of all the birds in the United States, of meaning billions of birds. A variety of factors, I'll get to it. But I wanted to tell you the story of one bird. This is called the black pole warbler. Now, black pole warblers are little guys. Um, let's see if I have one. It's a warbler, is a little bird that size, and I'll pass these around in just a second. But they're tiny little specks of birds that eat insects and nest generally in forested areas. Well, this black pole warbler you see here likes to go up to Canada, all the orange part in the north part of North America is where they nest. But in the fall, they all gravitate to the Atlantic coastline. And they wait there from anywhere from up to Nova Scotia down to Hatteras. They wait along the coast for the passage of a low pressure system, which brings the winds out of the northwest. And then they take off over the open Atlantic Ocean in a southeasterly direction with this tailwind. Now, as they get out over the open Atlantic Ocean, in time that tailwind dissipates, but they come under the influence of the standing northeast trade winds, which deflect them and give them a tailwind to Venezuela. And they make this, this tiny little speck of a bird, makes it in 88 hours of nonstop flapping. Somebody suggested it was like a human being running a four-minute mile for 88 hours. It's just an extraordinary athletic capability. And then they get into the jungles of South America. That's where they spend the winter. In the springtime, they can't use that same route because the winds don't favor it, so they island hop through the Caribbean on their way back through here. Um, it's just an amazing phenomenon, and not only do you have single species that do these in incredible journeys, but in the spring, when you look at Doppler radar, this image shows all of the Doppler radar stations in the eastern U.S., and all of the blue you see are birds. The only weather that you see there, there's a green weather system that's over the Lake Erie, and there's a green system that's over uh, Hatteras. There's one off of the coast of Georgia, and there's some weather in the, in the back. Everything else are birds. These are literally millions, probably hundreds of millions of birds. These birds take to the air at night, and they do so because they can get above obstacles, and there aren't any predators. Hawks and owls can't get to them if they're up high. And so this is this great phenomenon that takes place every spring and every fall right over our heads, right around us, and most of us are never the wiser for it. I don't know if this next slide will queue up or not. Let me see if I can do it. Yeah, it's not going to do it. Sorry. Um, but there's uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology does a thing called BirdCast, where they actually have a way of digesting all the radar data with the wind data, and they can give you a sense 
of where the migration is happening that particular night. And bird watchers, bird enthusiasts, live by this. They check these things out at night to know if it's worthy to go to the little birding hotspots, to go to Wendy Park or the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve or Shaker Lakes or out to Rocky River Reservation or down to Brecksville to see the bird migration. So it's a great system. It's been working for millions of years. What could possibly go wrong? Well, it turns out that one of the problems about flying at night is the fact that we do so much to illuminate the surface of the planet. I mean, when you think about the amount of light scatter from our cities, um, if you want to see the stars in the city, good luck, because there's just so much light scatter that uh, it masks all of the, um, the, the stars that are up in the sky or the planets. Take a trip out to Geauga County to Observatory Park some night to see how dark things can really be and how much of the night sky you can get. Um, and not only does that rob us then of being able to enjoy the night sky, but there's a whole host of health concerns that are attended by way too much light. Um, I know we, we, we need light for safety and security, um, but the fact of the matter is we could probably all agree that there's too much of it. Well, it turns out that birds can get really confused and impacted by that light, particularly as they're flying through the city. So imagine the city. Here's downtown. You're looking over towards 200 Public Square. Or in this picture, you're taking a look at the incredibly mirror-like reflective properties of the Hilton. Um, and you imagine these, these areas at night, brightly illuminated, you know, they're glorious. You know, we have Monday night football or Thursday night football, regardless of helmets. Um, the fact of the matter is, you know, downtown is just a showpiece when it's beautifully illuminated like this. But when the fog rolls in or there's low cloud bank, it turns out birds have to fly lower and those night flying birds get trapped and confused by the lights in the city. And the result of that is we walk our streets and we see this. This is a white-throated sparrow. Um, and this is, I think, by the uh, Global Health Innovation Center. Or you see a woodcock, or you see a Nashville warbler, or you see a magnolia warbler, or a catbird, or this is going to be a hard one, and I'm not going to depress you too much, but this next one, this picture was taken three mornings ago by the Rocket Field House. Um, that is a saw-wet owl. And what all of these birds have in common is they've slammed into the building or the glass, confused by the light and confused by the reflective properties of the glass. Now, what do we know about this phenomenon? Well, we don't know exactly why they're attracted to it, but I will tell you that every year they do the Twin Towers, the, tri the tribute in light to the, to the Twin Towers and the victims of 9-11. When they do so, they run the risk of attracting birds to those brightly lit beams. As a matter of fact, in this image, you can actually see what looks like little white specks in there are all birds, and they get into the beam, and then they just circle, trapped, confused, and disoriented. And they did this amazing study. If you take a look at this picture on the left, you see what, what it looks like at 10, 12 p.m. The lights are turned off. There's about 500 birds within a half a kilometer of the Tribute in Life. Um, 10.32, just that many minutes later, with the lights on, there are 15,700 birds that have all been drawn into the lights. Um, what's great about the Tribute uh, um, to the Twin Towers, the Tribute in Light, is they work with the New York Audubon Society. So when they see that the lights have captured birds, they turn the lights off for eight minutes, 10 minutes, and then turn it back on. And that way we can continue to have that tribute to the, the victims of 9-11 so that we don't forget that terrible day. But at the same time, we're not wasting the lives of thousands or tens of thousands of birds. So knowing that this happens, and it happens everywhere, including in our city, um, we got together with a number of agencies, the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, which is located out near the Hunting Ground Reservation in Bay Village, Cleveland Metro Parks, and the Akron Zoo. And I should actually have Lake Metro Parks um, is also a participant in this. And we started something called Lights Out Cleveland. 
And the effort was, what if we started a monitoring program so that we could walk the streets and actually start quantifying? So instead of me just telling you an anecdote, oh my God, it's terrible, I saw this poor owl that hit the window, we could actually put some numbers on this and meet on this to understand what the dimension of the, of the uh, problem is. So the great folks at Lake Erie Nature and Center, uh, Science Center started a monitoring program. Uh, the, the gentleman that you see in the middle in the blue shirt there with the shorts, he's always in shorts, his name is Tim Jasinski. He's the Wildlife Rehabilitation Coordinator for Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, a force of nature himself. And we now have an, a small army of about 50, 60 people that every spring from March 15th to June 1st, the spring migratory season, and every fall from August 15th to November 1st, they're out at 5 a.m. walking the streets looking for the casualties of these building strikes. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's the bad news. Sometimes it's like this indigo bunting on the left or that um, golden-winged warbler on the right. And some nights the, um, the, the death toll can be staggering. These are all dead birds that have been bagged and processed. And some of them are those feathered jewels. They're just beautiful little guys. But some of them are still alive. And so if they can get those live ones, they net them. They carefully put them in a, a paper bag, take them back to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. They give them fluids and do their best to restore them to health. And then if they're healthy enough to release, they put a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service band on their leg or a MOTIS tag, and they let them go. Here is uh, Janice Farrell and Tim Jasinski. Um, uh, tube feeding, um, getting fluids into the, one of these birds. And sometimes the uh, Lake Erie Nature and Science Center is just a sea of these aquaria that have all been outfitted to house these birds just to give them an opportunity to overcome the concussive effects of the impact so they can let them go. So many of the birds are tagged and some get something called a MOTIS backpack tag. This is something the Canadians uh, established, but we're getting more and more antennae in uh, the United States. And if the bird flies over a MOTIS antenna, there's one out at the Huntington Reservation, it does a data drop. And so you get a, you, it, it pings it, and then you get the information that that bird that you marked now has passed over that spot. So that's Tim holding a bird here. He, he released a um, tagged magnolia warbler one day, and within two days it was found, it pinged a tower 200 miles east of Montreal. I mean, it's just amazing what we're learning about this. So all of the birds that are released, the hope is, is if they've got that modus um, apparatus on them, or if they have a tag, if they're ever found again, then we learn more about the migratory habits of these birds. Since we started in um, uh, 2017, 7,519 birds have been recovered. Of that number, 2,308 were still alive. They were rescued, banded, and ultimately released by the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. There's a small subset that were not releasable that end up in places like the Cleveland Museum of Natural History at our Perkins Wildlife Center or the Akron Zoo. All the dead ones end up at the museum. And, you know, it's a sad thing, but they're all processed, and they end up being part of a scientific collection. And this body of information that we're coming up with, knowing the breadth of the migration, the composition of the migration, the timing and the tempo of the migration, is really important because no one's done this kind of a comprehensive, they don't have this kind of cross-section in other cities. And we've already had two scientific papers that have been published utilizing results from Cleveland. So this just shows you, this is just a route that a bunch of volunteers do, public square, the mall, they come out as far east as um, 9th Street, and then there's a group that go 9th up by um, Lakeside. And there's a, a, one group that also do, looks around the campus at uh, Cleveland State University. So if you just extrapolate from this, you can see that there are probably tens and tens of thousands of birds that could be um, becoming victims. And so it's a real issue because it's withering away at these birds that already have so many other issues. They're climate change, the fact that we've got, um, uh, we've got our forests in peril, you've got areas that are, they would normally winter in, like in the Amazon, that are burning. I mean, there's enough you know, stuff that they have to deal with. Getting over our cities 
should be something that we could do something about. So the whole point of Lights Out Cleveland and gathering this information then is how can we use it to try and um, work collaboratively with building owners and managers to say, can you turn out your lights? We recognize everybody wants to market their buildings. So the model that they use in Chicago is keep your lights on until midnight and then turn your lights off and keep them off overnight. And that way, at least, you significantly reduce the risk, particularly in those early morning hours around 5 and 6 a.m. when the birds who have been flying all night long make landfall, and that's when they're particularly vulnerable. Um, we're also finding out that it's the areas around green space. So if you look at the Erie Street um, Cemetery here, it is an unbelievable oasis. And any of you guys, if you're not birders, in the spring and fall, I would recommend you grab your binoculars someday and just walk down the street to that cemetery. It's amazing how many different kinds of birds you can see there. And all the, they're not living there, they're just using that as a green space to catch a breather, maybe get a meal, and then they can continue their migration in either direction. But as they end up in these green spaces, if there are buildings close to that, for instance, the side of Key Tower that faces the mall, we have found is a particularly um, hard obstacle for the birds because they come down to the green grassy areas and then as they're looking up into the windows, it reflects the area that they're in like a mirror and they think it's someplace they can fly into. And usually, you know, with catastrophic results. Um, in Chicago, where they have been great about this, and this was driven by Mayor Daley and City Hall in the early part of the 2000s, you can see lights on and at midnight, you can see how the skyline goes dark. And the orientation of Chicago being having a northwest orientation with a hard obstacle to bird flight being Lake Michigan, they have far more birds that are funneled through this narrow area. So this really is something that can be done, and there's probably at least a good 30 cities now that are doing Lights Out programs. So it's great that we're doing it. We're doing it along with Lights Out Columbus, um, Safe Passage Toledo, Lights Out Miami Valley, and Lights Out Cincinnati, Lights Out Akron Canton. So the idea is to try and get these, these urban areas to sort of connect our conservation efforts. We have... Um, a flyer, which I think parts of the, the a different flyer is going to be handed out to if it hasn't been already. And all we're asking of building owners and managers is turn your lights off in spring and fall migration season from March 15th to the beginning of June, from August 15th to the, be, to the beginning of November. And this is not to be unsafe. If there's lighting that's essential for safety, you leave the lighting on. But if it's extraneous, if it's decorative, it's a, if it's a, a building wash lighting, you know, that's the kind of lighting that, you know, if we can get that turned off, and to the extent we can in unoccupied floors or floors that aren't being worked in, if we keep the interior lights off. So the whole idea is to keep light in the building and not have it bleed out and then not be washing our buildings with light. And if we do that, you can save birds. And by the way, since you're turning off your lights, you're going to be saving energy. You're going to be, you know, minimizing your carbon footprint and saving money. So it's kind, we think it's a win-win. We're not, you know, this isn't a punitive thing. We've been very careful with all of our volunteers because they sometimes get spirited because when they see like the little saw what owl dead, but it's not about building shaming that. This is, we want this to be a positive thing. We want this to be a win-win. Um, so to date, this is the list of participating buildings. And if you go to Ohio Lights Out, Dot org. Um, you go to the Cleveland page and there's a scroll down menu. And you can see that we've got a couple of the uh, buildings on Public Square, 55 and 200. There are still issues with those buildings, with the glass, but those building owners and managers have indicated that they think that this is um, a, a reasonable request and they're trying, we're working with them to see if we can uh, minimize the extraneous light and the risk. Um, and we're looking to get to expand upon this um, to the extent we can. So that's the essence of Lights Out Cleveland, but there is a companion piece, and I've mentioned it several times now, and that is glass. These aren't Cleveland buildings, but if you, you more and more, architectural building 
envelope councils are calling for the greater use of glass in energy efficient buildings. That's fine, but glass has this unintended consequence of being mirror-like and a lot of organisms, bats and especially birds, can't figure out what to do. They think they can fly into it. And so this is a real challenge. And um, if you take a look at you know images like this, you can just see how much light scatters there. And if the tribute and light seem bad, well, there's just a lot of light that would be uh, um, attracting um, birds into these spaces. And once into these spaces, if they're in those green spaces, then they're trapped by all of the, the light that we have there. Um, and and all, all the glass, rather, that we have there that they might run into that's exacerbated by um, those foggy conditions. So one of the things that a number of people have been reaching out to both homeowners and building owners and, sure enough, to architects and designers is, what are the ways that you can mitigate that? How can you have your beautiful glass windows but minimize the way it reflects on the outside. Um, this can be done in the home, and uh, there is an Ohio Lights Out registered home, and you can put decals on your windows. There's different kinds of dots, and there are different kinds of strands that you can put in front of the windows just to make the glass visible to the bird. Um, and indeed, if you take a look at this house, this is from the American Bird Conservancy, they have this really inexpensive bird tape, and you just put little strips down, you might feel like you're in jail, but you get used to it. Um, but anyway, the, the notion is that spacing of four inches is critical because then the birds can see it. Well, I'm really happy to report that there's a lot of folks that are now starting to embrace the idea of decals or films or strips to save birds. Um, buildings like this, if you go down to the Akron Zoo and go to their visitor center, they've got all sorts of decals. It's very decorative. When you're in the inside, it's totally bright and lit. doesn't seem to take away from the experience at all, and they don't have any casualties. More exciting for our discussion here, though, is the CSU Law Building, the library building. And if you look at the left picture here, you know, you can hardly see that there's anything different about that glass. You can see how well it reflects the trees that are in the neighborhood. But if in the right side, when you come up close, you see that there are all these little translucent dots put on there. Jennifer McMillan is their director of sustainability, and we talked to her a couple of years ago and gave her all of these these resources from the American Bird Conservancy on bird-friendly buildings. And so she found a company in Akron that would put on these little translucent dots. And they did this whole facade of that building, which was a huge bird killer. And this last fall, I don't think they had one bird strike. And, you know, it looks pretty handsome, and it's not a big deal. There's Hopefully there'll be more and more technologies coming out that won't have a high price point where we can take a look at glass and, and remove the threat and still have all of the things that we like about having a transparent window to look at. So what Lights Out's all about is we're about promoting citizen science because the nuts and bolts of this are boots on the ground, volunteers that are not, you know, they're not professional wildlife biologists. They're folks who, you know, work anywhere in this county, but they are called to try and take action and do something in a positive way, either to document the occurrence of the dead birds or do their best to recover the live. Um, the whole idea of conducting humane collection, treatment, rehabilitation, and release of stunned birds. The idea of applying the results to conservation science and promoting urban sustainability. And truly, we are advancing our knowledge and understanding of the timing, composition, breadth, and mechanics of nocturnal bird migration through this region. And that has been borne out by the publication of scientific uh, reports. Um, and then the other cool thing is that you know we've had a lot of uh, the Plain Dealers cover this uh, through a couple major articles. Um, it's been on Fox 8 News. We've been on IdeaStream. It's been covered by a lot of the media stations. It's, it's attracted a lot of uh, attention, and there seems to be more and more people that want to participate in this because it's something they can do. It's good exercise, and you learn your birds as you're doing it. And again, I said before that we are part of a, a, um, a statewide effort under the aegis of the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative that is trying to, to make Ohio a much friendlier place for birds. Um, what we tell folks, how do you make a difference? 
live a bird-friendly life. What's that mean? Well, you can feed the birds, but you could just be conscious of the things that we have in our buildings or the things we do in our lives that might be a problem for birds. Uh, landscape with native plants, get involved in citizen science, volunteer for local bird and conservation organizations like Lights Out Cleveland, keep your cats indoors, because cats probably kill five million songbirds a day in the United States. And those aren't feral cats, those would be house cats allowed to go outside. They are a major cause of mortality. Turn your lights out, use tape, decals, films, etc., to protect birds from glass. Protect bird habitat if you've got it. Become informed, be a voice for birds in nature, protect our biodiversity, take action for global health because all of this, healthy ecosystems that are biodiverse are ultimately resilient and those ecosystems are, we rely on to sustain us for clean air and clean water and the other benefits. And of course, vote with the idea that you've got these things in mind. And that's sort of my canned program, but I have a couple extra slides because you told me to. When we think about these big issues about, or maybe birds, does, they don't seem that big, but you're, you're linking them to this great global phenomenon that takes place every year. It's really useful for us humans, being a part of this community of living things, to just think about our role here. And I share this picture. I saw this at a biomimicry session that I took 13 years ago, and I was blown away. Someone did the calculations. If you took all of the water on the surface of planet Earth, the blue planet, 75% is water, and coalesce it into a sphere, it's that little blue marble you see on the left side of your image when you compare it to the great volume of planet Earth. And you might say, how is that possible? Remember that water in the oceans maybe only goes down three, four, five, six miles. Compared to the great bulk of the planet, it's next to nothing. And if you took the entire atmosphere of planet Earth and coalesced it into a sphere, it's about the size of Western Europe. And all life as we know it operates in those two spheres. And when we think about issues of of climate change, you know, how could we possibly change the entire atmosphere of planet Earth? Well, that's how big the atmosphere of planet Earth is. It isn't so limitless as you think. You go up into space and you take a look at just that edge, that little glowing edge. You have deep space in, in the back and you realize the atmosphere only goes up 150,000 feet, at least that where life might have a chance of being. Um, and then you might have life that goes down 10, 15 miles below the surface of the planet. That thin skin of the onion, that outer skin, that's where all life occurs. That's where we live as part of this community of living things. There's a great Senegalese um, ecologist who came up with this line, in the end we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. And I don't believe he meant to being in a classroom and being lectured to, it's by our example, by the things that we value, by the, the, the values that we transfer from one generation to the next, about this connection of this, this extraordinary blue marble, this pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan called it, um, suspended in, a, in a, um, a moat, it's like a dust moat suspended in a sunbeam. This is our planet, and you can relate all these things to the dynamics of that planet because there was a time, 1800, state of Ohio, anywhere actually in Eastern North America, this bird looks like a morning dove, only it was much bigger than a morning dove, kind of like a morning dove on steroids. It's called a passenger pigeon. It once numbered five to seven billion birds strong. It was the most common bird on the face of planet Earth in 1800. In 1900, in a town called Sargent's in Pike County, Ohio, the last free-flying wild passenger pigeon was shot. And 14 years after that, on September 1st at 1 p.m. at the Cincinnati Zoo, Martha, the last of her species, fell dead off her perch. And with that, the species was no more. And extinction is forever. We can talk about de-extinction, or can we bring them back or clone them? From a functional standpoint, this bird's gone. Why was it gone? 
It was so numerous, everybody thought it would never get rare or it never needed special protection. But it nested in the forests that we were cutting down to settle Ohio and the other states in the east, and it was good eating, and so the market hunters would go out and they would shoot them by the millions or tens of millions. Even to the Civil War, they were still holding on okay. But after the Civil War, with a, a well-established railroad system and the original social media, the telegraph, now if they came and nested somewhere, the word went out by telegraph, everyone knew about it, the market hunters would come, they'd blow them out of the sky, fill their barrels, put them on the railroad trains, and they'd be served up at Delmonico's in Manhattan a day later. We had a, a system of mechanized harvest that just decimated them. And everybody said, oh, but they've got all the forests in the north to go to. Well, in nature, we're running out of wild places for animals to go. And these animals I'm talking about, these migratory birds that are nesting perhaps in the pine forests or the spruce forests of northern Canada, those forests are under uh, pressure because of climate change. So could the passenger pigeon happen again? I will tell you there are species that are going extinct probably daily on this planet. And many of them are small little things that we haven't named, we don't know what they are, and you might say, well, who really cares? And I'll leave you with this one kind of um, fable, um, only it's true. We think about how we find cures to, to diseases, for instance, and oftentimes we look for plants or animals that have some kind of a novel chemical they make, and then our medical um, community figures out a way to harness that. Well, in the 1970s, the National Institute of Health conducted a survey of plants in the United States that might have medicinal properties. And they happened to find a thing called the Pacific yew tree. So this is related to the taxus bushes you've got in your landscape at home, the ones that the deer like to eat. Um, and in the forest of the Pacific Northwest, it was a weed. It was a garbage tree, and as they were logging these forests, they were trying to do their best to get rid of it, to get this, just this, it's a pest. Until they did this assessment and they found that it produces a chemical, an alkaloid chemical, which is called taxol. And when they started to look, to look at this chemical, they found that this chemical had an amazing ability to stifle rapidly dividing and growing cells. And they thought, hmm, what disease is characterized by rapidly dividing and growing cells? That would be cancer. And so from it, they developed something that's now called Taxotere. And if you have prostate cancer or breast cancer, one of the chemotherapeutic agents they often use is Taxotere, and it helps prolong life. All found from a garbage, weedy plant that everybody thought was totally useless. Well, if there's millions and millions and millions of species of things on this planet, most of which have yet to be described to science, the novelty, the genetic novelty, the cures, the new foodstuffs and fibers, the things that we could be using practically are out there, but if we let them become extinct before we've ever even named them, what a loss not only for us, but of course we're impoverishing future generations as well. So. All of this is part of, you know, that concept of sustainability more than just what we're doing with the resources that we're, you know, the energy resources that we've got or reducing our use of plastics and those types of things. It's also what about these other biological phenomena that are happening around us and how do we get better con conscious of them and make sure that our cities and towns are friendly or at at, the, at, at least benign to all of these other great uh, forces in nature. And that's my spiel. And I will just do a little show and tell right up here, and then I'll answer questions.
turn my mic. Um, there is a black and white warbler and a black There you go. So, 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 Dale, so Dale, you know that when you, I mean, one of the great things about um, about going to McGee Marsh is McGee Marsh is a it's a state wildlife area in northwestern Ohio, and it is all of this marshland with this maybe eleven acre woodlot with a boardwalk through it, and all these birds when they're moving at night, as you approach dawn, then there's they're all, they literally, there's a fallout of the sky because they're looking for a place to grab a meal. And they don't want to casually fly Lake Erie. They want to make sure that they're rested, they've got a full belly before they're going to fly that. So they all descend in this area, and sometimes that they have something called the biggest week in American birding, which is generally the Mother's Day weekend or the weekend following, where they can have as many as... 20, 30,000 people or more birders out there, everyone with, with cameras and binoculars and spotting scopes bigger than the rest, all to enjoy the phenomena of these amazing birds and their colors and their sounds. Um, and it's just a riot. And, and it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, it, and, and the thing that it's cool about it, uh, just to uh, introduce a practical element, is that all of the Chamber of Commerces in the counties that surround there now love birders because in spring and fall, those areas are dead. In the summertime, it's a boater's paradise. Everyone's coming up to be out on the lake. But now people are spending good money to stay in the hotels, to frequent the restaurants, and it's, all, it's a powerful, powerful tool for economic development. I wrote an, an op-ed for the plane dealer about 10 years ago making the same case for the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. You, you read Dyke 14, it was just sitting there, Mother Nature reclaimed it, the birds are already using it, why not just open it up and build it and they will come, birders will come and, and bird there. And that has Wendy Park on the west side and uh, the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve have become premier bird watching sites and people come from a lot of distance to be able to bird here. So this is just, this is the nature of the resource um, and these are the kinds of things that, that um, are at peril when they're coming through the town. And so this is informational, but I would hope at the least maybe the county could look at buildings that you've got and see if you could um, perhaps think about ways of turning lights down or um, minimizing that. And then working collaboratively to see what are the opportunities not only here but elsewhere. How can we advocate for others to take glass, bird-friendly glass solutions, um, and try and do a better job of, of minimizing the risk to birds in Cleveland. Thank you so much. We have our public works director and team here. Um, I have just a, if you can go back, a question about the windows. Are there certain um, floors on the windows that need the stickers or the whole thing? And then you can get with our, do you want to come up? Um, Public Works to see if this is something we can collaborate with and well, become lights so, out. But to, uh, just to, to to answer your question, what we think is that the f the facades of buildings that face green spaces are the ones that po uh, pose the greatest risk. Which you know, right here, you don't have a lot of green space other than if the birds are using some of these corridors. Um, that said, we think that the primary um, threat are the lower floors. It's the first two floors. Um, Michael Dever, Department of Public Works, along with Matt Reimer, who's in charge of my facilities group, and T. Morales, who is a uh, facility superintendent who does takes care of day-to-day -day operations. First of all, I'd like to say this was a very uh, thought-provoking um, presentation, and I appreciate you coming in and, and presenting on it. I've learned quite a bit just over the last half hour listening to your presentation, so I truly appreciate that. Um, in regards to the county facilities and the downtown buildings in particular, um, I, I know over the last 10 years or so, um, there has been certain efforts that we've undertaken 
to um, try and minimize the lighting in, in regards to just uh, the efficiency of the building itself also. And I think there is more to be done, obviously, and I, I think there is opportunities to look at it. And then in this lease facility we're in now, there may be an opportunity also working with the, uh, the landlord guys in, in opportunities to possibly put some type of that screening on those lower floors. So I'd need to go back with them, have some conversation, and figure out um, you know what it would take to do something like that. And maybe we can come back in the near future and report back on some of those efforts. And if we can exchange contact information, um, there are bird-friendly building design guidelines um, from the American Bird Conservancy that are kind of useful about, you know, what's the low-hanging fruit? What's the, the most inexpensive? Okay. Where do you get the, most, the, the biggest bang for the buck? The, okay. The so I appreciate everybody. I don't think there's questions. This was, do you have any questions? No. Okay. Thank, I, this was very informative. And I think we have time to become lights out because that would start again in the spring, right? Mm -hmm. Where we need, we need yeah. our own logo and, and, on and, being lights out. So that's turning the lights out, midnight, Till the morning during the migratory seasons. So thanks. And, and if yeah. I can just say the, the other important part of that is just to be a leader in it because we find that some building owners and managers downtown embrace it and others are kind of like, you know, well, is that building doing it? Well, contact me when that, but, and you know, we get this, this type of thing. And there, there are a number of buildings. I first started this about eight years ago and I called it Smart Light Safe Flight. Downtown building, uh, downtown Cleveland Lines worked with me, and there are folks that will turn their lights off at midnight, but then turn them back on at five so that they're illuminated for the morning news. And so that's just the time when the birds are coming to the to the earth, and it puts them at the greatest risk. And actually undoing that and trying to make sure that we keep the lights off until dawn has been a real issue there. But um, we stand, uh, both the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and all of our other partner agencies will help out as, as, as we can. Thank you so much for coming down. Okay. okay. We really appreciate it, and we'll reconvene to try to become a Lights Out partner. Thanks, everybody, for um, being here.